Mini episode 1232 of the FDH Lounge is brought to you by Sportsology, delivering unconventional columns and webcasts about sports, TV, music, movies, and more. Follow them on the web at sportsology.com. The FDH Lounge. You want to schedule your life around it. A long time ago, on a gloomy, wet Cleveland spring night, two men stand alone amidst the late night drizzle. Their voices echo across the vacant station parking lot as they debate the merits of the great American radio show that have been missing for far too long. On that night, an idea was born. That idea became the FDH Lounge. Welcome to the FDH Lounge. Hello, everyone. Welcome to FDH Lounge mini episode 1232. This is part 14 of our Coronavirus Crisis 2020 series, looking at all different aspects of life during the lockdown. And this one here is going to be on the status of streaming services and uh, changes that are happening in the landscape. Arguably, streaming services have never been more important. This is sort of their moment because of the dearth of programming out there. Sports programming has ground to a halt altogether, and uh, you, you have new programming that has pretty much, uh, I mean, filming uh, on just about everything pretty much shut down in March, so we're still seeing whatever was left in the can, but that is rapidly diminishing returns, and don't know when it's going to get back to normal. I have to give a big tip of the hat to FDH Lounge dignitary Ben Chu, who actually conceptualized this show idea and certainly has some good thoughts in his head on this and uh, the evolution of streaming services during this critical moment in the history of the industry. Good to have you on, Ben, and thank you for coming up with this idea. Well, I appreciate it, Rick. I thought, somehow I now get to tack on another expert thing on the title for the lounge, so it's, it's perfectly fine with me. Very good, very good. Uh, I can... I can offer you the basketball editor uh, thing in real time here. Would you accept? <laughs> <laughs> I thought I, I already was your NBA analyst, Rick. I don't need to be. I don't need. You don't need to be an editor. Oh, okay. All right. NBA analyst. We'll keep it at that. And uh, <laughs> NBA analyst <laughs> slash general oh, FDA challenge secretary. <laughs> Well, I've I've been uh, I've been uh, dispensing the titles a little bit uh, somewhat more freely recently, but uh, as people deserve, right. and certainly uh, you deserve anything that I can uh, throw your way. Uh, we would certainly put uh, pop culture slash TV analyst as well, which is what we're sort of getting into here with this segment and with your idea on this. And I know first off the bat, one of the things that really caught your eye was, uh, and I noticed it as well. You've got the whole thing with the debut of Quibi during this time period where they were set to debut. Now, this is not a last dance type of deal where they moved it up. No, they were just set to debut right about now. And uh, again, a, a 10 minutes or less, you know, mini bites kind of a deal. Uh, something to be watched only on phone or tablet, so no smart TV uh, effects for it. So a unique service in a couple of different ways. And one that would be, I would think, in a lot of ways, uniquely suited for this time in America, and for that matter, around the world, and yet the launch hasn't gone well, and absurdly, uh, they seem to be pointing fingers at the pandemic, when I know you thought, and I agree with you, that you can't blame it on the circumstances, because the circumstances, if nothing else, should be helping you. Right, and I mean, this, this entire I believe so. Yeah, it was Jeffrey Katzenberg who did a who did a piece with the New York Times blaming the coronavirus for the rough story of the company. And uh, we were always I was monitoring Quibi because I've always discussed with people who are doing short form content and just how the landscape of the media looks like in terms of the timeline. And for me personally, I thought Quibi was going to be an intriguing idea. I wasn't really sure it was the best idea, but it was an idea that I think a lot of us were going to be 
true. And here's the thing, is that I have a couple of things where I can only watch them on my phone for various reasons. But I, I've said for a while now, I ain't a snob. I'll watch stuff on my phone. I don't care. But anybody I talk to tends to generally disagree with me, and it's not a matter of age. Folks, it's generally folks my age or older who will disagree with me, but I think I've had folks younger than me disagree with me. For a lot of people, if you can't watch it on TV, that seems to be a, a killer for them. I wonder if they underestimated that factor. There's not enough people like me, quite frankly. thing also, Ben, and this is something that I had noticed about them, is that they have a number of shows, apparently, where they are serialized. So, we'll give you 10 minutes a day. Let, let's say it's a standard movie-length type deal. Maybe it would be parceled out over like 10 days. I don't see the upside in something like that in 10-day increments. If it was me, if it was something that I really wanted to watch, I'd wait till the end of the 10 days, and I'd just watch all 10-minute increments back-to-back. -back. I, I mean, you know, have these folks not heard of, of how big binging has gotten? I don't know that there's anybody that's like, oh, give me just 10 minutes, and I'll wait another 24 hours to see the next 10 minutes. How many people are wired that way? Absolutely, yeah. And that, uh, it, there's, there's just any number of questions. The one thing I will say to you about not having TV as an option, although something tells me you could have done this where it would just work on the mobile version, and obviously it would be disabled for TV if you had a TV app for it, is this is one of these things where, and I think this is on all of their shows, if you turn the phone one way or another, you can get different views of that. It's not the same view at a different size. It, you might actually pick up different things on the landscape. But by the same token, I'm also thinking as I'm watching a video about this, like, who is out there working their phone like an Etch-a-Sketch? Like, let me turn my phone back and forth 85 times a minute so I can catch all the different views of what's happening here. I, I, I mean, it, 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 that's one of those things that sounds better in a focus group than perhaps in reality. Although, in fairness, I haven't seen it play out personally. So what, I, what do I know? And I mean, I think the issue for them is that it wasn't that the idea is a bad idea. It's that there is definite growth within the platform and the market. The problem for them is, is that you run a, it's already a crowded media market in terms of Netflix and Hulu and all these other things with crazy shows and crazy programming. And if you, as much as I personally love Chrissy Teigen, I'm not going to go download Quibi to watch Chrissy in a Chrissy court. I'm not. That's just who I am as a person. You have to have stuff, I think, that's 
You absolutely do. And uh, again, maybe there's still uh, time for them to adjust on the fly and uh, make the changes that they need to. But again, it's you've never had more potentially, uh, I would say, almost hostage eyeballs as far as uh, people who are uh, stuck at home, deprived of a lot of their usual TV programming, looking for something else. I mean, I, I continue to say again, it's ludicrous to blame any problems on the moment. It's the moment that should have been beneficial for them, and uh, I think it makes it harder for them to climb out of this if they didn't get a great start in their estimation during this time period. Something that I think is bound to make a much better debut because it has uh, a world of muscle and impetus and synergy and everything behind it is HBO Max, which I think it's May 27th. I think that's the debut date for it uh, when that drops. And that is the thing I have been saying. I think that is the service that has a chance to become the biggest monster in streaming. When we did our recent February 29th time capsule, our predictions for what would happen by February 29th, 2024, my prediction was that that would be the biggest streaming service in the world on that date. Uh, because of the entire HBO library and so many other things from Warner Media over a period of time. Warner Brothers, they've got friends. Granted, they had to bid for it from Netflix, but they had to tie in because of the, uh, the Warner Brothers production of it back in the day. All these things that are part of the library from Warner Brothers production and other type things as well, uh, the synergy that they have is just absolutely uh, immense. And that is going to be something that I think people are really, really, really going to appreciate. Because you think back to when Netflix appeared to be the thing where, you know, if you want it, it's there. And even then it was overstated. Netflix never had every last little piece of stuff, but it seemed like it, right? Nothing will ever really seem quite that way again. But I think HBO Max is going to come closer to that feeling than most other services will. Right, and they're, they're definitely the after. Clearly, the big kid on the block that's going to be intrigued because we, in the totality of the streaming landscape that we've seen, the big three of Netflix and I, I don't know why I'm blanking on this now, the big, the big three of Netflix, Hulu, and just how. Am I, what, what Would it I be Disney? Are you, are you putting Disney Disney Plus in there? You no, have. I'm, I'm, I'm clearly missing another one somehow. In there, but so but well, well, I think Disney Plus belongs there well, already. Disney, yeah, yeah. That's what I'm really. Yeah. I'm really trying to say that that's the big three that I think a lot of people were discussing. Yeah. Moving forward. It's going to be four. Max, it's, it's one of those services I would put out there that is going to be the most intriguing because with Netflix, Netflix was the initial bird for most people into the streaming format. I know Hulu came out a little bit before Netflix really got into their group, but that almost felt like Hulu was going to be a TV replacement, not a new source of Right. And just because of how everything was just pushing forward is that we're seeing more and more unique streaming opportunities for people and for different sort of companies. And I think HBO, not HBO and ETC with Warner Media, they have a huge depth of new shows, old shows. I mean, you, you didn't, we were not even touching on the percentage of other shows that we didn't discuss yet. We're not even mentioning the West Wing. We're not mentioning the Big Bang Theory. We're not, you know, we're, we're not talking Pretty Little Liars as well. I mean, they have a huge dirt of prestige television that a lot of people love watching. And it's going to be homes in their area. My big question for HBO Max moving forward is going to be their new, their new content. And there's definitely some interesting ones that people have been discussing about. Obviously, you know, the one starring in a Kendrick Love Life is going to be one that a lot of people will be intrigued by. The, the uh, vehicle with uh, Kayla Coco, I, I don't know why I'm blanking on the name of it right now, but with the one where she ends up playing a, uh, playing a flight attendant. Oh, there we go. I, I can get it right there. It's called the flight attendant. Oh, the flight attendant. Okay. For the younger kids, they have obviously said to be three for them, the, little, the not too late show with Elmo is going to be another new vehicle that they're going to have. So I think just in terms of how HBO is going to be, the big thing I think for them is going to be they have the old school prestige television that I think a lot of us love. But is the service going to fall into a trap that I think a lot of these services run into? And it's the issue that I think a lot of people have now had with Disney Plus is, is that there is a limit to what someone will rewatch over and over again. And if there's not enough new content, people are not going to want to stay engaged with the service. 
I think that's a good point. And what I wonder about is, and you, you don't have this with other streaming services as much. Conceivably, you might have it a little bit with, uh, with, with Hulu slash Disney Plus in terms of what's going to make it on there versus what's going to make it on uh, ABC now that uh, Hulu is a wholly owned entity of Disney. But I think it's even more pronounced on the HBO slash HBO Max side, and that's going to be what kind of shows are you going to put just on HBO Max versus on HBO? Because you're going to want to spend enough to get you know some really good, solid things on HBO Max, like you said, the things that people will be able to continue to follow as new things as we go along here, but you don't want to do it in terms of cannibalizing HBO. I know that their business plan, without having looked at it, obviously, I know they've already uh, obviously accounted for the fact that they don't want to cannibalize that, so it must mean a vastly increased overall budget to where they're going to keep spending what they spend on HBO, but then they're going to spend what they spend on HBO Max, and then some of it's going to be, uh, you know, to what degree are they willing to put loss leader programming on HBO Max just to keep the new subscribers coming in, because I don't know that uh, whatever you're going to be paying for these new shows on there as a network uh, is necessarily going to justify the cost of it, but like you said, you got to keep people hooked with new content, and I don't know that the new stuff off of HBO and these other places is going to be enough to do it. Right. And the one thing that, is, like we've discussed with HBO Max, they have a very wide catalog of things that I think is going to play their ability. Like, I mean, we, you know, we discussed Friends, you know, they also have Doctor Who, they'll have the Fresh Prince of Bel Air, they'll have a lot of these old prestige television, but I think one of the big things for them is that HBO, and I'm going to say this now, they're going to have one big edge over Netflix and Hulu, and I think it's going to be the HBO film library. Mm -hmm. Have you also heard, uh, if, for those of you who aren't having paid more attention to us, that Studio Ghibli is going to be part of them too, Spirited Away, a lot of My Name is Totoro, all those sort of you know, Crest Beach anime is going to probably be on HBO Max as well. So I think this might be the more eclectic streaming service out there, Rick, but I also honestly believe that it's going to be really dependent on their future success is the original, like you know, is the original programming. Because at this point, I would not say, like, unless I'm a big fan of a certain series or something that is mitigating over there, I don't necessarily feel the need to get another streaming service. Yeah, and I think that's how a lot of people are. And so that that's what's going to make it difficult, that when you're coming in after so many other entities have come in, but they're coming in with this depth that we have just spent several minutes describing as opposed to Quibi, which came in as a blank slate, Apple Plus, which came in as a blank slate. When you're coming in with the firepower that they have, uh, I, I think it's a, it's a different story altogether and I would think too now granted this is a deal that would have to be made I'm gonna make a clip and uh, save prediction here they'd have to make a deal because it is an outside entity but it is one of their strongest programming entities on TNT Wednesday nights for those uh, who have enjoyed watching the new all elite wrestling product uh, AEW Dynamite the last several months would not surprise me if as we go along, as they start to accrue more pay-per-views and things of that nature, maybe even old episodes of AEW. I predict one way or another that will find its way there. AEW, at some point, they might be nursing thoughts of starting their own streaming service, maybe at some point, but they're years away from having enough of a library to be able to do that. In the interim, my prediction is they will license their content to HBO Max after a certain period of time. I mean, one thing we're going to talk about sports as well, there have been prior discussions with Bleacher Report and the Premier League and the NBA since Turner is part of the deal on some level. They, there's going to be discussions of simulcast or anything very similar to what Amazon Prime does with the Thursday Night Football package. And I would see a scenario like com coming up where I could see the NBA essentially saying, like, we're not going to give you guys the playoffs per se, but if we, if you guys want the regular put regular season NBA games on where I think a demo cast would be really makes them make a lot more money because I think a lot of basketball fans aren't exactly, I would make this your argument, they're not the type of people that necessarily need to watch a game every night. Right. And I think they could definitely pick up a bunch of people who would be intrigued enough to switch from like Netflix to be like, well, hey, I can watch live Premier League games, I can watch live NBA I think that's a big enough sale that most people could switch over because I think, and this is the discussion point that we're all going to see happening.
thing is from the current model, the existing model, what used to be was Netflix was the big, big bad bully on the stream. Hulu was second, and then all these other streaming services like Crackle and other these other smaller ones were kind of fighting for full position. Now we're seeing Netflix move up to number one. Hulu is now a little bit below them, but are catching a big Disney Plus is right there, and now HBO Max ability to move up and down depending on the narrative. The real question is, and I think, like we said, it comes down to their original content, and I think that's going to be their make or break essentially because I don't think a lot of people are going. I think eventually, and this might be one of those weird timelines that we'll discuss this too. It's due to the coronavirus, our sort of landscape lifestyle is going to change in the short term to where I could see an initial rush go to HBO Max and be willing to spend a little bit more money for more content. But the big question I ultimately have, and I think we're going to discuss this, is that when we reach the old normal of our society, are people going to want to continuously have to bundle multiple streaming services on top of multiple streaming services? I just don't think, I think streaming fatigue will exist at some point. Very possibly, and I want to compare and contrast as something that you talked about with another aspect uh, that you didn't get into. You talked about how Amazon Prime pr provides uh, the, uh, which, which by the way, that's another one of the ones we, we, we should have been thinking about yeah, earlier too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Prime is definitely uh, one of them. In definitely the top three now. Yeah, in, in terms of the way that they do the Thursday night NFL deal, it's a separate deal. The league has a separate contract with Amazon. It is not part of, I mean, they, they might share camera angles and whatnot. They might share, I mean, it'd be redundant to have extra cameras there, right? But their, all of their commentary, all of their play-by-play -play is their own. It is unaffiliated with NFL Network or Fox. Compare and contrast that to ESPN, the GameCast for the College Football National Championship. Also, I think they do it for uh, the semifinal uh, playoff games for the New Year's Six. That's a thing where there is synergy. I could see what you're talking about here uh, in the NBA playoffs, maybe even building up to the conference finals, which is always the pinnacle of what uh, TNT gets to cover every year, that and the All-Star game. If you had some kind of as you're saying, alternate coverage under the same banner. So somewhat more akin to the game cast because it's the corporate synergy as opposed to Amazon Prime, which exists outside of NFL Network and Fox. I could see some type of deal there where, because this is something Turner has actually done previously, if you think about it, with the Final Four of where they would put the games, they would put the Homer games on TNT and TVS, which were just, in my estimation, just awful. The games where you just put on the screamers for their home team, and uh, there will always be people on uh, Twitter screaming about, why do I have to listen to Rex Chapman's crap while I'm trying to watch a uh, national semifinal, not realizing that that was the UK coverage. But something along those lines, like I said, they've done it with the Final Four. I predict they're going to take what you said and apply that to the NBA and other properties. And, and I think that's just one of the natures of how sports and streaming is going to be because I think, as we all know, cable deals are still going to be in existence, but over time we're going to see, court cutting, we, we discussed this over, over, over the years on the FDA's launch, that court cutting has accelerated at a length that I don't think we predicted was going to be. I think a lot of us were like, well, we're, we're not going to, all of us are not going to be court cutters entirely. And again, the last bastion of court cutting is sports. There's no other way you can 
I agree. I think it'll be alternate coverage of the big events. I think there'll be some exclusive events, like some NBA regular season games, maybe some other sports right. coverage as well. And I could definitely see that happening. Uh, in, in terms of other news and notes with uh, streaming entities here uh, during the pandemic and, and them being front and center, what were some of the other developments over this period of time that you've had your eye on? I mean, the one thing I've been intrigued by the most, Rick, is just the growth of non-realism television during this whole pandemic. Obviously, the biggest winner so far, you would guess, is Tiger King and Netflix. Yep. That just became the whole thing. I mean, before The Last Stand even came out, it was the most popular documentary on Netflix. I yep. mean, Disney saw, I think, a substantial growth just in terms of their, their, view, their user base during that timeline because... As you can understand, during the early pandemic, kids were now, or their parents were home with them, and they needed an outlet, and the outlet was definitely Disney Plus. And a lot of shows, I think, and we'll, we'll see the, te- the the true tale of the tape at the end of the day with a lot of these properties is that there are going to be shows that got the coronavirus bump, and we're going to see a lot of shows that I think people we wouldn't have discussed normally in our timeline is are going to I'm not sure what will be specific of their realism, if it's not realism, if it's people wanting something completely different. I mean, we discussed one, there was an article recently discussing how Netflix's reality TV strategy had essentially put together our new normal with shows like The Circle, Love is Blind, Too Hot to Handle. It's just, it, it's just a bizarre timeline in terms of how we consume media because we all are stuck in our own home. Like, I can't think of another timeline in the, in the history of the U.S. outside of being sick for like the flu for two weeks where you have had the whole, no whole bar wanting to watch as much content as you could. And we're going to see people's viewing strategies shift over a period of time. Yeah, we are. I, I haven't been able to uh, unearth any historical research on streaming patterns during the Spanish flu pandemic, the last time we were all locked down in this country. I don't exactly remember uh, what was being shown during that period of time. I'll get back to you on I, that. I think it was river coverage, I would have said. <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah, it was a uh, slightly simpler time in the entertainment industry back then. But, uh, yeah, these these things now, again, any any shows that, you know, the Tiger King always had a chance to be something that would pop into the mainstream. But, I mean, the timing of it, uh, you know, really couldn't have been better in, in just a raw business sense as far as when that came to pass. And again, it gave Netflix a relevancy. Uh, that, and this whole thing has really given Netflix uh, kind of a boost. And, and, and again, and I do, I, I'm just going to make one blanket overall acknowledgement of the skeeviness of talking about business winners and losers in a worldwide pandemic. I mean, it is what it is, people. It's, there are winners and there are losers. There's a lot of tragedy that's out there right now, economically and health wise. But that's that's not to deny the reality of some folks just really raking it in because of the circumstances. And uh, for Netflix, yeah, it has been somewhat of a turnaround. After the last couple of years where the story had been erosion, it would be, been, oh, they're losing friends, they're losing this other property. Oh. It, was, it was just the sense that things were being stripped away from them, uh, that uh, you know Disney was taking back all of their properties as they were getting Disney Plus and Hulu. Uh, really, really going. So, you know, it, Netflix has, has had a turnaround. We'll see if they can sustain it or if it reverts to the previous storyline, which is they're going to have to rely on original content to an extent that might not be self-sustaining. Right. And the weird part of all this is that two years ago we had this big discussion, is Netflix going to be with all this, with this by, by, uh, by, bifurcation, essentially, of all of the properties that used to be on there that were I think the true irony of this is that Netflix's strategy, which was to build up as much unique content as possible, really played into their hands at this point because a lot of the major issue that a lot of these movie studios are going to face, and I, I, again, we still do not know the real true timeline of when Hollywood and when things for Canada and other streaming locations are going to get back to normal. Right. Really, in terms of shows and in terms of different ideas, in terms of just viewership and filming and just all these things. The real question is going to be is, is that Netflix's strategy, which was to pour all this money on original programming, is going to pay off at this timeline because they 
have a slew of shows that were not in, in the existing pipeline years ago, and now that you're essentially forcing many human beings to stay home and not talk to other people, if you think about it, it's a perfect strategy to release as much content as possible because most people are going to want to have the escape of the current reality. It's just it's basic human psychology at the end of the day, Rick, which is when you're forced to be in a single location and you cannot do anything, you're going to look for something to escape to. And for most human beings and most of most streaming fans around the world get streaming services. And I'm really intrigued to see the shows that get the bump, the shows that we're going to be talking about much later on in terms of just how amazing it's going to be and how many streaming services are going to be benefited by this in the long run. I think there are a lot of people in discussion that were like, well, is Apple TV going to survive this initial initial problem? They've seen their numbers increase in terms of total viewers, and they're going to now probably see a bigger bump as more people try to add on to things that they just want to see. Because what we what I noticed is just in terms of the economic data, in terms of how we're spending less, you would make the rough assumption, and, and since we don't have the data, I cannot say if this is true or not, more people are willing to spend more money on streaming services now than ever before. And I think in the short term, a lot of these streaming services coming in are going to get that dollar that would have been added to other things that we would have discussed. Yeah, and what I think is savvy, there's a move that Disney made, and granted, I, I'm a big homer for this actor. Uh, he's one of my favorite actors, but I think it was a smart move. You're seeing other services that are making some flashy moves as far as throwing money at movie stars uh, with Quibi, with Anna Kendrick on uh, Apple Plus, uh, of course, Jennifer Aniston, Steve Carell, who ironically started as a TV guy, but is now, you know, a, a, a star of the big screen, versus what ESPN, I'm sorry, uh, what Disney Plus just did with The Mandalorian, announcing that they are locking down for the next season Timothy Oliphant. And it's a thing where it's a smart move, because there are a lot of people out there that are big marks for the guy like I am, and that... What they're chasing in that sense is people who are into watching prestige dramas. So for somebody like me, who I've enjoyed him, he's had bit parts on a lot of things where I think he's been great, but predominantly known for Justified and Deadwood, where he was awesome on there. It, I think that's a better strategy. I think it's better to get actors and actresses of that caliber, ones that are predominantly known for prestige shows, get them on there, as opposed to throwing what I'm sure is bigger money at big box office ones, where I, I, I don't know if it'll necessarily always translate. Well, I, and, and it's going to be interesting to see with the shift now, because I think a lot of people are focused, and it's weird, and we haven't even talked about the movie industry, how they're going to be impacted moving forward. But you're going to start to see, I think, a lot of prestige television getting pushed forward now, because I think most people are going to prefer to have these escapes from their current normal everyday life. And I think a lot of shows you're going to see are going to benefit from this. I heard there's rumors that I heard that Destiny on Netflix, the vehicle with uh, Linda Cardinelli, has, has done great numbers so far. And it, it, you're, we're going to start to see different streaming services try to market different ways to different people. And I think ultimately in the long run, which will be very beneficial to these players, is, is that Eyeballs are still going to be prevalent more than ever, even though we are now starting to reopen up the economy. The economy has, in many major parts of the country over time, you're still going to have to, you're still going to, we're not going to be out of the woods at the, until the end of, at least I would, until at least I would say 2021, at least as earliest. So you're going to start to see people turn inward for their entertainment instead of turning outward. And this is where streaming is going to be huge because they're going to win big because of this. That's an excellent point, and uh, a couple days ago on Facebook, I cannot remember the movie, but uh, original FDH lounge dignitary Chris Galloway had mentioned there's a movie coming out in July, and uh, he said based on, uh, his sense was based on the number of theaters open, how it does, that's going to be a real barometer on whether the theaters really get back open and showing this or not. And, and there's been questions, quite frankly, for a long period of time, about what's going to happen with movie theaters. I mean, this is a thing where it, 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 I'm not saying this in the negative sense because there are relics that persevere, 
but as a business model, it is a relic. I mean, we're, we're over 100 years into the whole movie theater thing and, you know, people going to watch things there when now we're, we're so used to the ubiquity of being able to see stuff on all our different devices and whatever. So as this will be a critical year, maybe the critical year coming up in the history of the movie industry and where it's to go from there, streaming is certainly re ready to sit here to, to, to pick up the pieces if something should happen uh, to that as a distribution model. Mm -hmm. And I also think, too, as the big thing that we saw during the pandemic, too, was the blue book movies to, to, to essentially streaming releases. Obviously, Trolls World Tour was another. I mean, we keep coming somehow back to Anna Kendrick. I don't know why. Yeah. But Trolls World Tour showed that you could have a movie released just on streaming television very, very well. I'm intrigued to see a lot of these other vehicles that have, are going to come out during this timeline that weren't seen in theaters and how most people, I think, the general movie going population is never going to fully go away, but I'm going to, I, I'm going to predict now that we're going to start to see a lot of people who would have gone seen a movie in the old timeline. Now they're like, well, I can, if it comes on streaming, I can just pay for it then. Why would I waste the time and the effort? Well, the thing is, too, and, and I see this all the time, that there are movies that not long after they're out of the theater, uh, I see them as pay-per-view options on TV. I've actually never dropped any money on any of those, uh, but I see them there constantly. So the infrastructure is already in place to be able to offer these things to the home viewers, have them pay a nominal price, and if it's for a ticket price, which would be at or probably slightly less than what they would have paid in the theater because you're cutting the theaters out of the whole mix here. Uh, again, you can't tell me that that's not a viable way forward. The whole thing, they're like, well, how will there be a movie industry if there's no theaters? That question is, is lacking in imagination. I'm not saying it's going to go that way, but I'm saying that there are so many other things. I mean, you look at what this pandemic has done as far as decimating the restaurant business in this country and about how a lot of non-chain restaurants, sadly, uh, unbelievably, are going to be gone for good. Who's to say the same thing couldn't happen to the, the theater business? And I mean, I think the big thing, too, and, uh, and we've seen this locally, I've seen this locally from the big town in Oregon, that drive through are now so full of problems. Yes. For the next couple of months to years, too. They're coming back in Cleveland, too. Yeah, exactly. And I think they're going to be a big overall. I think the weird part about this pandemic is we're seeing the shift. We, we, it, it's, in the totality of our current shift, it's inward. But I think in the longer run, it's going to be pushed outward in terms of just everything at the end of the day. There's still going to be, you know, I like to use this analysis. The bastions of the restaurant industry are people that want to go out and be seen and to get good food. There's a very small congruence of people who go out to a restaurant at the end of the day and essentially say, I'm going there to watch an event. Outside of sports, there's not really a reason why you go to a restaurant instead of eating at home. Right. So I, I think we're going to start to see the movie industry start to adapt. We, we saw that more recently with better deals on food, you know, streaming services like movie pass. So extremely, excuse me, streaming tickets, but movie ticket services like movie pass. We're going to start to see a lot of these companies start to get very creative because you're trying to get people who are fearful of getting a virus or getting sick, going to change their patterns. And I think for now it's very temporary because I, the big congruence that I've discussed with the media in terms of the entertainment world is that we're making this assumption that this new normal is going to exist forever, and I think that's kind of a lie because we as human beings will always revert back to what previously has always worked. But we are going to see a shift in certain things that could become things that we perceive as not main things anymore, like the drive-in movie theater, become staples again because people are going to clamor for what they what they had previously had. Yeah, and that, uh, I mean, that is something that nobody would have had on their 2020s predictions is the possible return of uh, the drive-in uh, drive movie business. Uh, everything old is new again, but uh, yeah, I mean, so you, you've got that, uh, one of the older uh, forms of entertainment on the one hand with this cutting-edge streaming stuff that we're talking about on the other hand uh, any other streaming news and notes that you're thinking of, of of any real particular import during this time I mean I think also during this timeline one big point I figured I would pop it in just in terms of the narrative is that with all these streaming services finding trying to get new different unique pieces of content it, 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 it's very rare right now in the, in the current timeline where we've seen a prestige hit across the board. We've seen House of Cards, we've seen The Handmaid's Tale, but since then, we haven't had that one show on that one streaming service that essentially will force people to buy it for the 
Yeah, I think that's uh, that's a very good point. And uh, again, I, I think all of this bears watching as we go along. And that uh, you, you know, again, when the historians are looking back on uh, streaming, which again, it's only going to get bigger from here because streaming, I think. It is sort of the in-between thing in the grand period of history between cable TV as we knew it and the a la carte future that's still out there. I mean, this, this, with streaming and cable existing side by side, this is sort of the in-between period of time, but it's going to get more, as you said earlier, bifurcated over a period of time. And uh, this will certainly be regarded historically as a very fascinating uh, period and a very consequential one for streaming. And uh, again, as I said uh, at the outset, uh, a brilliant idea for you to have us uh, talk about during this period of time. Thank you for that. Thank you for being on today, my friend. Well, no problem, Rick. At the end of the day, if I've learned anything, you know, HBO Max will really be determined on one thing, and that's going to be the Gotham Pro reboot. They will for that, definitely. Yeah, we have that to look forward to if you're into that kind of thing. So we, we'll we'll be uh, catching that. When it comes, in the meantime, everybody, thank you for joining us for this mini-episode of the FBH Lounge.